Hello and welcome PML fans. I am your host Joe Zamore here and also your host for this video is Stuart J. Mills. Yo, yo, how we going? We are bringing you the PML Draft Center recap for week four of the PML Draft. Week four. We are getting nice and spicy into the reg into this regular season and we can't wait to talk about the first match of this week. Take it away, Stu. Yes, we are. And we, as usual, we're gonna we're gonna start off with your match as usual. Since it wasn't good. How do you enough. feel about that? It's it's never good enough to be game of the week. <laughs> <laughs> Not this week, anyway. I mean, um, where are we? When you allow Grim Snarls to get into a kissing match, I don't think it deserves to be. <laughs> that was probably a highlight, but um, so for me. The moment of the match for this one was there wasn't one, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna so, so for me the moment of the match was the end. Um, what can I say? I, you know, I hate to be negative, but man, I feel like I wasted 20 minutes of my life watching this match. Even at times two speed, it dragged on. So I can't imagine how it felt for you. <laughs> oh, going through it, it wasn't easy. I, I give you that much. It was not easy to play through. I mean, you I mean heard the me whole point of the chess timer is to like give you give, give you time to think, but not full minutes of time. I mean, this isn't Pokemon Showdown, you know. Mm -hmm. Alex, man, you've got to pick your moves faster. There's no other way around it. I mean, you are picking your moves, trying to be as fast as possible. There's no way these matches should be going to timer, usually, let alone 6-4 or 5-4 or any scoreline like that. So, you know, it was a bit of a, bit of a down buzz as far as the... Because it was the first match that I watched as well, so I was like, "Oh no, what a start to the week!" <laughs> but um, Close start I mean, overall, you, you, know, you, predicted, you predicted the right, yeah, you predicted the right lead. You didn't get the right strategy, but you predicted the lead. So you had Whimsicott in there against Incineroar, and you broke its probable focus sash with Fake Out, and then of course Whimsicott has been clicking Trick Room turn one, but this time it clicked Tailwind, which <laughs> has the advantage of pranked it. And then you get, you destroy it with a flare blitz, which was a good start. I was like, okay, that's a good start, nice and quick. Salamence comes in and intimidates the Incineroar. Uh, takes advantage of the Tailwind, of course. Good play by Alex, I think, to bring special Salamence, considering Incineroar has Intimidate. So it might have uh, been a switch in, perhaps. But uh, Party Shot's going to be annoying either way. Um, did you even bring Party Shot this week? And I think you did. Uh, no, I didn't. I brought Will-O-Wisp hmm. over. So, I mean, Fighting Shot was would have done much better against that set. So, uh, I mean, you, you predict the Dragon Moves, so you switch into Grim Star, which was fruitful. Mm -hmm. Because then that forces Alex to switch into Ditto. Because, uh, of course, Ditto copies Grim Star and makes it a dark type, which means it's not affected by all the pranks, the moves. Um, could have switched into Scrafty, of course, for the same thing, but if Grimstar had clicked a Fairy move, then it would have been a bad time for Scrafty. So now we get into what was probably the thing that everyone will remember about this match, and it's the Kissing Contest, as you said <laughs> it, Joe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, it's a pretty even contest, all things considered. You trade a few crits and both regain about the same amount of health each time, but uh, you eventually relent. You're, you're going to give in. You don't want to have your Grim Snarl stuck in there. So you send in your Krogonal, and that may, that Alex sends in Hatterene, which gets a Trick Room off. Yeah, but him, and then sends him, it. him sending that in kind of helped in my favor because that's what I wanted. <laughs> that's the matchup I was hoping for. Yeah, I know. Exactly right. And then he sends in Scrafty to go and face the Krogonal, but by this time, Alex is used up you know, so much of it's clock that, you know, it's going to go to timer, and it's just like, like you see, I feel like we've only had like five or six turns and we're already going to timer. It's quite disappointing, but, um, you know, I was pulling my hair out at 6-5, <laughs> knowing that it was going to go to timer, but, uh, you, you see the scenario, and it's coming out, it's just nasty. Uh, Mintz comes in, intimidates you, you miss a will-o-wisp, uh, 
the cinema gets chunked for 75 percent with hydro pump mm -hmm. uh, draco not gets rid on for over half but is forced to rate so you're forced to recover as scruffy comes back in uh you decide not to tox it because of the header ring in the back but you get faked out anyway so it doesn't really matter it then uh knocks you off as you scald and then you recover as ditto comes back in um, here you expected a recover from Ditto to regain some health, but you ice so you ice beam. But it chooses to toxic, unfortunately for Alex, the toxic misses. Um the ice beam kills the Ditto to make it six four and then it goes to timer, which is just it's hard to be positive about that situation, to be honest. Yeah. How did you feel how did you feel post match? How did you feel coming out of that? I was very frustrated because I felt like I could have got like a five oh or 4-0 out of that game and ended up being a 6-4 and I mean granted Braz Tippy was excited that he didn't get blown out but it honestly could have been if uh, not for it going to timer I mean exactly right like I feel like I had the momentum I, I just I, and I, I, had got, the... I, I, I got no words yeah I've got no words for it. You had the momentum. Uh, the match probably would have gone your way anyway. I don't think being happy with a 6-4 timer loss is good. You, you either play hard and lose 6-0 or you, you know, I just, don't, I just don't get it. I wouldn't be happy with a 6-4. It seemed very, you know, it's like kissing your sister. It's just disappointing. What are you doing? <laughs> That's the best way to put it. Yeah, it's not it's not a fun time to go to timer ever. I mean, a win's a win and a loss is a loss. So, but yeah, you, you want I mean, to if, be... if you come into the, if you come into a match expecting it to go to timer, unless you've brought hard stall, which he hadn't, he didn't bring hard stall, then you can't expect it to go to timer. You should be trying to get the win. I don't know. I mean, yeah, it, I mean, I at, guess that, it's, at that I guess point, it's, it's just like. A... At that point, it's just kind of like, eh, I mean, if they if they want to take that, they can, and they could they could hold that. But it, it, it's not as exciting for the fans to see, you know. No, it's just one of those things. I just didn't expect it, and there you go. But that brings us to our next match. Which is? The Slowpokes, the McKesney Park Slowpokes, coached by Operator versus the Crushing Silvales. And their coach escapes me right now because I'm slack. Some IT. Some ITNG. I'm not exactly sure how hey. they like to say their name. <laughs> <laughs> That's all good. So, you know, this was a, this was a good match. This was much better. Uh, very entertaining. And. Uh, for me, the moment of the match was when Siglif got its weakness poly policy activated by Slow King and had a bit of a mini sweep in the middle there. Um, a close second place moment of the match was Gigalith being trapped by Sandtoon Sizzle, which I think is a great tech. Like, it's been done quite a few times now, so Sandtoon should be expected by some people. But um, yeah, it's always cool to see Sizzle not just come in and have its normal moves like knock off and U-turn and bullet punch. It's got Sandtoon. Yeah. So, so that, that was my moment of the match. That Samtune tech is new to me because I didn't expect it. That's particularly good because obviously when you're facing a sand team, getting rid of the sand setter is always going to be a bonus. That's a fact. I, I would know. Trust me, I just battled someone else in another league with a sand setter and that didn't work out well for me. <laughs> yes well there you go once you know what it is then uh now next time you can prepare when you see sizzle and you go oh maybe it's got sand too anyway so for this match i'll start off i really rate the wrestling themed pokemon names from apparatus always a bonus when you have good nicknames oh yeah you gotta love um, those and... wwe nicknames that's right so he leads um, Milotic against the Sork. He regrets not leading with Sableye at the time, but um, 
you know, it's not the worst lead ever. But he switches it in, switches inside low, turn one to take a knockoff, and because he doesn't want Melodic to lose its flame orb before he can activate it. And uh, of course, with Prankster, Saberlight can get the Will of Us off, but he immediately regrets it as he expected Absol to switch in. I don't know why that was an issue. Maybe he's getting confused with Mega Absol with Magic Bounce, but um, regular Absol would have it would have been great to burn it. I think. Mm -hmm. um, however. Slow can get sent in and is burned. I thought it was a good opportunity to recover with Sableye, but he sent some big damage possible, so he clicked Poltergeist. However, um, Slow King scores and that blows Sableye out. Um, you know, Slow King's got, what, 110 special attacks, so even with no investment, it's still quite strong. I think it's, uh, you know, people forget that. But um, that's when Apparatus sends in his Sizzle and correctly predicting the Gigalith coming in, he clicks Sandtoon. And unfortunately, the first time around, it misses. So, you know, Gigalith's lucky there. Probably would have been too much KO'd uh, or close to it after all the damage built up. But uh, Gigalith sets up the rocks and then Sizzle successful as the second Sandtoon, which traps Gigalith with it. Uh, Bullet Punch then rocks Gigalith and the Sylvalis choose to click Iron Defense. Um, it's probably a turn too late in my mind. I probably would have clicked Iron Defense before Stealth Rock if I, that was going to be my strategy. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the end, Giggles goes down. It you know limits the sand turns there for extra drill, and so the Sylvalis have to send it out straight away, try and take advantage of some of the at least some advantage of the sand. It clicks Substitute in front of the Sizzle, which breaks the sub with sand turn. I don't know if he was relying maybe on some hacks with the sand turn missing or clicking something else, but um. <laughs> the extra drill is obviously very strong and it kills the sizzle with earthquake which surprises the operator he wasn't he thought that it would at least tank one but um no took it out so you know didn't reveal an item was it banded or is it just you know earth plate or something else we don't know yet yeah of course it's not banded it's subbed but you never know it could be have some other move it's he sent just... it melodic and it gets a free school um so it can come back in to take it. Melodic, that means it gets its uh, Marvel scale off with the Flame Orb. And he switches in Sigalo. And of course, on that turn, Slow King clicks Future Slide, which is great. It's what he wanted to see, because uh, Sigalo wouldn't take much from that. Uh, it maxes. Slow King tanks a max overgrowth, as it's obviously very especially bulky. However, it activates Sigalo's weakness policy, and that gives it the plus two special attack boost which it needed. Um, the next turn was a little bit strange. I don't know if they predicted another max overgrowth, but the Sylvali sent in Amoongus and it gets blown back by a max airstream. I feel like the max airstream was pretty obvious though, to be honest, but you know, once again, heat of the battle, you can't always make every prediction correct. Mm -hmm. And then another max airstream kills Excadrill from 75%. So we have Sigalof here, plus two, Special attack, plus two speed. It's already killed um, Amoongus. It's killed Escadrill. Sloking is not looking great. Um, <laughs> the Sylvali send in Absol. It comes in and maxes straight away because it's the only way they're going to survive anything. It still takes well over half from a regular Air Slash. And then it kills this, the single of back with Max Airstream. And um, then it comes in, tanks the Max Lightning. It's school, it's pushing for a burn, which it doesn't get. And then uh, Apparatus decides to send in Serena to try and um, to predict another Max Lightning. Mm -hmm. Which it does, it tanks that, no problem. And then it rapid spins for the speed boost, which also takes out the Epsol, which was a handy second effect. Um, that leaves Sylvali sending in a Sork. It does, has um, turned out to be Scarf, which was revealed at this point, it takes out Serena with Poison Jab. Uh, it does just over half to, to Slurpuff. Apparatus was a little bit disappointed because he thought it was going to do way more than that, so he didn't click Belly Drum, but it turns out he could have. Mm -hmm. However, not that, um, not that it was needed. <laughs> it wasn't needed. Yeah, ultimately, it wasn't needed. It recovers the health, the health of Citrus Berry and gets the Unburden Boost anyway. Um, Play, Play Rush still destroys the Sork on the next turn, and then it's one more Play Rush against Slow King for a comfortable win. 
Yeah, a big thing in that match, I feel, is um, if Sock would have been sturdy, it might have been able to do something to that scissor lift while it was Max. It could have lived that hit. Um, yeah. And then That's fired right. off a good I, I knockoff. Was, it was strange that it was, um, was it, was it more bracket? I was surprised. Um, but yeah, you're right. I think I was sturdy. I expected sturdy, actually. But, uh, Yeah, it wasn't to me. Yeah, it wasn't, and that's what, uh, I think that's ultimately changed the course of the battle, because I feel like, uh, he could have at least chunked that Sigilif down to range for something else to kill it, if anything, but, I mean, it's, it's still a max weakness policy pop Sigilif, so who knows. So, yeah, I don't have much else to say about that one, but, um, no, it was good, it was a good battle, he's fast becoming one of the, one of the favorites here, Parader, he's got good strategy, and, um, you know, he's got a good game plan with each match and he thinks about his turns, which is good. And he still clicks the buttons fast. So, yeah, it's a pretty good combination. Very threatening for his opponents. Definitely. He certainly started off the season strong and he's keeping it up throughout this season. But then we can move on to our next battle for this week. And that is the uh, Fire Squirrels and the Victinis. Um Shelby and Rick at Mike. This was a good match. I thought um, the moment of the match for me was when Nina Queen and Akazot maxed on the same turn. Uh, Akazot was faster because of the hail, which meant that when Nina Queen used Max Flare, it changed the weather and made it faster the next turn. So I basically got two max turns in a row for Akazot's one. And yeah, it was really good tech. I don't know if it was planned that way. It probably was. But um, yeah, it worked out great for Mike. Yeah, it definitely was. Mike was talking about it in his uh, video. Uh, he really was glad he got rid of um, uh, Nine Tails along with its uh, screens with that brick break hit. And um, they figured uh, Arc Result was obviously going to move first. And they knew they ginned uh, Needle Queen correctly. So it could live any hit from yeah. it, Max. And. <coughs> Yeah. Changing the weather and taking that speed advantage from it was big. Yeah, so um, right from the very start, it's a little bit, you know, up and down for Shelby. She needs Tauros, like she did last week against Archeops. Um, Archeops was Sash, so Rockslide took it all the way down to Sash, 1 HP. Archeops sets up the South Rocks, and then it uh, endeavors the Tauros down turn 2 uh, to 1 HP before dying to another Rockslide. So pretty much the best start you can get from Mike. He gets rocks up, he gets Tauros, a massive threat, down to 1 HP. And secondly, he gets Ferramosa in for free and gets a free U-turn. So a lot of free moves here for Mike. Early momentum, early control. Uh, the U-turn takes out the Tauros, of course, and he can bring in Duraludon. And now this is where Shelby brings up Flareon. Um, I realize it's a team mascot, but to me, Flareon is far and away the worst evolution. Uh, in battles, anyway. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't expecting miracles here. Uh, I feel like its only viable set is the Guts Toxical one, and that wasn't the one she brought, so I wasn't expecting even more after that. Uh, Duraludon switched out into Mandibuzz. It took nothing from a Flame Charge. I mean, Flareon's got base 130 attack, and it did nothing. Yeah. They did nothing. That's um, just the yeah. tanking power of that mod. Exactly. I mean, Mandibuzz <laughs> eats a Flare Blitz, no problem. Um, took, took nothing, surprise, surprise. And it easily lives two, as Flareon takes itself out with Recoil, and obviously the second one's a free roost for Mandibuzz. So Flareon did nothing. Um, Nine Towers comes in and Moonblast a Duraludon before setting up an Aurora Veil. It lives a flash cannon on three, thanks to the Aurora Veil, and decides to go for the freeze dry. Probably going for the freeze. Uh, Duraludon then reveals it's carrying Brick Break, which not only takes out the Nine Towers, but it also takes out the Aurora Veil, which, as you mentioned earlier, huge. It was a huge turning point there for uh, Mike to get the battle on his side even more. Um, there aren't many Hell turns left, so Arkazolts gets sent in, which finishes off the Duraludon with a stomping tantrum. Doesn't max yet. And then a queen came in, which I personally found suspicious, but, um, you know, 
not to be deterred, shall we still Maxes? Yeah. I need to find that Mike that, that Mike Maxes as well. Uh, Max Quake doesn't doesn't do much to Nether Queen. I don't know if Max Hale would have done more here. I think it would have done a bit more because of uh, stab damage, but I don't think it would have yeah. been a big difference. <laughs> and um, and then Arkansas gets blown down to red by Max Flare, which yeah. also stops the hail, as, as also mentioned earlier. So the Nether Queen then outspeeds the Arkansas and Max Quakes to get rid of it, and it's two remaining Max moves. Um, yeah, I don't know. It was it was a rough turn of events for Shelby there. It was kind of up against the wall already, and then that made it worse. Mm -hmm. uh, Dust Noir came in, got chucked for 75% with Max Quake as it trick rooms. And it basically, if Blastoise versus the world, Nether Green crit poison jabbed the Blastoise down to 8 HP, which was like rubbing salt into the wound. Yeah. Gets killed by Ice It gets killed by Ice Beam, however, Mandibuzz comes in, Brave Birds, the Blastoise to kill it, and finishes it off for a very nice 3 0 win to Mike. Very nice. Yeah, and ending it with Amanda Buzz win is a way to make a statement in week four. Well, it also makes up for his huge loss last week to that Blaziken, so mm -hmm. he'll be glad. He'll be glad to be back on the uh, winning side of the podium there. He definitely mentions that in his uh, post match uh, ramble. He talks about how he's uh, glad to be back and all that. So, yeah, GG to Mike. Great to see. GG for sure. It's it's rough coming off a big loss and then trying to make a comeback win the next following week. Hundred percent, especially a convincing one like that. Well, that brings us to our next match this week. Uh, that leaves us with the. Uh, oh, I'll leave this one to you, Joe. Actually, we got the Team Tempest versus the Nauruhata Hoppers. <laughs> there you go. You got a first try. Um. So. This is a this is a really good match. I considering Kiwi was in control for most of it, the fact that uh for me the moment of the match was where he forgot Gal Wings was a thing and you know, lost his Neuburn because of it, with all its uh Dynamax boosts that it had got. Mm -hmm. But uh that was a small blip in an otherwise positive turnout for the Tempest, so um, it was an easy lead for Kiwi, even at Team Preview, he was like, oh, he didn't bring ground time, so I'm going to leave Rotom. So he leads Rotom, and they unfortunately lead Tentacruel, which is unfortunate for the Hoppers. Mm -hmm. um, Kiwi clicks Bolt Switch, as he said he was going to do, and Tentacruel outspeeds, and Sludge Bombs the Rotom. There was no poison, however. Uh, we find out later on that Tentacruel scarf, but we don't know this at this, at this stage. Kiwi goes into Cinderace on the Bolt Switch, and immediately U-turns out. And then this is where we find out that Tentacruel Scarf, because it outspeeds. And it sludge bombs the Cinderace for 60%, and this time it does get the poison. And then not only that, it lives in the U-turn into, uh, and then Dust Crops comes in. Uh, Kiwi goes, uh, has a bit of a thing, clicks Nightshade. Uh, the Hoppers also switch out to uh, Critterly, which as we know is a pretty bulky Pokemon. Mm -hmm. It uh, Dustclop takes nothing from a Giga Drain, and then what does Critterly do? It Power Herb Meteor Beans and Dustclops. Yeah, it was um, going for that special attack boost right <laughs> then and there. I was going for the boost right then and there. I don't know if I would have done it against the Dustclops, but I guess there was no other mod to do it in front of. Um, the Dustclop survives easily and gets off another Nightshade. They trade a few Giga Drains and Pain Splits until Critterly ends up going down to Poison. So ultimately it did nothing. It was a fun tech though. It was good to see. Yeah, I like seeing defensive mons brought offensively occasionally. Mm -hmm. um, then you've got uh, Seville comes in to face the dust stops on 20 HP, which goes down to Dark Pulse. Kiwi sends out his Darm. He says it's Scarfed, and it U turns into the Clef Key, which got swapped in. And it had the same tech as we saw in the match last week, where it was your Jeff Buttoned Out, which stopped the Darmanitan from switching and the hopper sent in conk elder so darn stuck there knowing it it's it's scarfed into u-turn and so kiwi switches it out into rotom as conk subs the sub gets immediately broken by volt switch and kiwi sends out neuvern and it doesn't take the resisted it's resisted close combat very well at all it takes it down to about 30 percent mm -hmm. but kiwi is not 
um, not to be held back here, Max is the Noivern, despite it being at 30%. And the Hopper's sack tend to crawl to a Max Airstream. Of course, that raises the speed of Noivern. Already a very fast Pokemon, but now it's very fast. Clefki comes in, sets up a light screen, as Noivern still takes it out, even through the light screen with a Max Flare. Yeah, I think that's that Infiltrator that played that yeah, part. A... That's right. Oh, that's true, yeah. Good point. At this stage, it's 5-3 to the Tempest, so... You know, it's looking pretty good for Kiwi. The Hopper sent out Conkeld and a Mock Punch some more damage off the Noivern before that goes down too. Uh, this is where Kiwi unfortunately forgets about Gale Wings and Noivern goes down to Talonflame's Jewel Wing Beat. Luckily he didn't miss, but um, yeah, so when of course when it's at max HP, Talonflame gets priority on its flying moves and that cost Noivern there. It was, you know, had its speed boost and everything, so no good. Mm -hmm. uh, Talonflame then protects to see what Kiwi does next as he tries to rationalize the whole that whole turn he's talking about how was Talonflame faster um, he sends in Rotom and clicks Hydro Pump in the sun which was interesting and it's behind the light screen so Talonflame takes you know 25% from the Hydro Pump as Rotom gets toxic by Talonflame so we've seen toxic Protect and dual wing beat from the talent flame. A little bit of toxic stall just to hurt the Rotom some more, but a, a Volt Switch then takes it out, leaving it 4 1 to Kiwi and just leaves the Thievul to go. And um, he's pretty confident Cinderace will kill it with a U turn, even if it maxes, and that's exactly what happens. So it was a big win to Kiwi in the end. 4 yeah. 1, uh, 4 0, yeah. sorry. And it t takes them to 3 1 overall. Yeah, definitely. And it was an interesting way to see Kiwi fumble around at the beginning because he was kind of like wondering what that tentacle set was going to end up doing to him. And with all those switches and crazy things he had to do at the beginning and almost losing Cinderace to Scarf uh, Tentacruel, he was able to overcome that and get the momentum back in his favor and run it the rest of the rest of the game. Well, exactly. And it shows that even on low health, Cinderace is still a threat. Oh, yeah. um, it, you can still send it in and it can do its few turns out and stuff and not take much toxic damage and things like that so yeah it was well worked in the end uh, Noivern obviously they are MVP of this match but um, the Hoppers I think they'll regret some of their plays especially like maybe mock punching the Noivern blah 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 but it's hard to say whether that would have made a difference yeah. in the end the Talent Flame play was great. It was a great set. Uh, Toxic Protect Talent Flame. It's such a fast Pokemon as well that um, you know you can make use of those those uh, Toxic Protect strategies. But uh, it wasn't to be this week. GG. We'll see how they do next week, and uh, let's see if Kiwi can keep it rolling as well. And that brings us to our next battle there. So here we've got the. Uh... The Chardinals and the Corfish in this match. That was a fun of one. Of course, the, the uh, Chardinals coming off their big win last week. So uh, they were hoping to go, I think they're trying to go 4 and 0. Yeah, they're trying to stand undefeated. Right? Yep. They try and to the Corfish, is it... and they do. They do very successfully. Uh, for me, the moment of the match was when. Porygon 2 freezes the Alakazam as it was poised to well yeah, it might have swept There's still there was still some hacks involved but um yeah it was uh, a lucky turn of events that's the save for the Chardinals but a good one match match winning in the end yeah the Cornish Corfish coached by Alice um, she was uh, very adamant about how lucky that was uh, being a 6.3% chance to freeze because you get a 20% chance for status and three statuses, ice being one of them. The most effective one, you'd have to agree with. And... Definitely, definitely, especially because it can't um, put you to sleep. If it had sleep as well, it'd be even more busted. Oh, yeah, no. Nah. But luckily, it's, it was only uh, Ice, Electric, and Fire, but uh, Ice ended up being that 6.3% that popped off, and uh, Nasty Plot Alakazam didn't get to get going like it wanted to. Exactly right. So, at uh, Team Preview, the Chardinals are quite happy not... Oh, 
surprised not to see Dragovich because they thought it went in against their team. But it meant that uh, Rotom could have a much better time. So he sends in Rotom cut, grass type, against mm-hmm. Quagsire. And he knows it's not going to stay in. So it's basically a free Volt Switch. It would have been a big play by Alice to stay in there, but uh, understandably switches out into Lego. Um, very especially bulky, of course, so it doesn't take much from the Volt Switch. And uh, so the channel sent in Corviknight. He sits there and considers setting up turn two, but they decide against it, and they take a Thunderbolt from the Nihiligo, which does just over 50%. Uh, then Nihiligo, of course, not very physically bulky, almost dies to an eye head. It would have changed the course of the match if Nihiligo had died here, but uh, the Corvish want to save the Nihiligo, and so they send in the Quagsire, which takes another iron head from the Corviknight, mm-hmm. and then not wanting to stay in, the Chardinal send in Rotom as Quag Earthquakes. Now, this player I had to scratch my head again because Corviknight was in, which is immune to Earthquake. Mm-hmm. They have a Rotom in the back, which is immune to Earthquake. I'm not quite sure what the prediction was. Um, I haven't seen that side of the battle, but yeah, luckily it was I an was part of, play. Luckily, I was kind of part of that battle, uh, being a proxy for Alice, and uh, they were... Uh, Predicting that Corviknight would uh, roost on that turn, and they wanted to try to catch it with an earthquake. I see. That makes a lot more sense. So, in that respect, it wasn't the worst play ever. But uh, unfortunately, switching in Rotom turned out to be a free switch. Mm-hmm. And then the Chardinals once again—they're 100 percent confident that they're not going to switch quicks fire out this time. So they click Leaf Storm. And sure enough, Quagsire stays in and just gets obliterated by the Leaf Storm. As yeah. we know, four times super effective. So, yeah, that um, and there that was, was nothing really left in the back to take a hit after Nihilego dropped so low. <laughs> that's true. That's true. So, um, in comes Obstagoon, and the goon, the goon gets us pretty much a free knockoff. And Clefable comes in to take it, loses its item. And they're not wanting to mess around with the top scoon, which of course now activated its flame orb and cuts. Mm-hmm. Clicks Moonblast. Uh, the goon obstructs first to see what Clefable wants to do. And luckily it did because it would have died. Seeing that Clefable wants the Moonblaster, that sent, uh, they send an Alchemy to take the Moonblast. And in turn, the channels send in Porygon 2 to, uh, you know, defensive behemoth that it is. Mm-hmm. Can't keep. Alchemy Man does, doesn't want to get poisoned, so send out Obstagoon, and of course Porygon can't toxic it because it's already burned. Great play. Then Facade does a ton to Rotom. Doesn't quite take it out with the first one, but it goes down to the second one, 100%. Um, perfect time to send Clefable back in because it can almost freely click Moonblast because Obstagoon is never going to stay in. But of course Obstagoon gets switched back out into Alchemy. The table goes back to Porygon 2 and, you know, repeats the cycle a little bit. Alchemy recovers back to full and goes into Nihiligo as Porygon 2 teleports, which breaks the cycle and gets the momentum back on the Chardinal side. Mm-hmm. Thinks for a bit about who to send in, decides on Blaziken, decides on Blaziken, and thinking that Alchemy is, uh, you know, takes a ton, sorry, uh, Alchemy not knowing what attacks it has, Blaziken takes a ton from Sly Shock, but uh, thankfully for the Chardinals, they, they bought a berry this week, recovers the health, and takes the Nihiligo out with knockoff, which Nihiligo reveals itself to be Scarfed there. Um, Swoobat comes back in, uh, comes in, sorry, and faces the Blaziken, and then Dynamaxes takes a knockoff from Blaziken to for its half its health, but what item is it holding? Weakness policy, of course. So Swoobat's now plus four, thanks mm-hmm. to its simple. And the Chardinals send in Clefable to stall out the max turns with Moonlight. Luckily, it takes nothing from plus four attacks in Spoobat. Mm-hmm. It lives a max airstream, restores almost all its health, then protects the last max turn for the, you know, a small bit of damage. Spoobat flinches Clefable once. The Chardinals mention, oh, we might lose to flinches here, especially after the first flinch, but thankfully for them, they get a few Moonlights off and then kill Spoobat with Shadow Ball. So yeah, that threat's that, gone. That Clefable didn't get his neck of people didn't get flinch tax as bad as i thought it was going to he only got one out of four i only got one exactly right 
So the goon comes back in, the fable protects to see what it's going to do, and then gets blown back by a facade. And so now it's 3 3. You know, the game is quite evenly balanced. Uh, the Chardinal send in Go Lurk. They're a little bit worried that Obstagoon's going to do a ton of damage to them, even if they're Dynamax. So the first turn that Obstagoon is in front of them, Obstructs versus the Max Quake. And then the second one, it takes a ton from the knockoff, but does kill the Obstagoon with Max Quake. However, it then goes down to a side Shock from Malakazam, which was looking at because Gunnick was plus two special defense, obviously. So side Shock was definitely the great bring there. Mm-hmm. And this is the part where the match turned on its head, where Porygon 2 clicks try attack and it freezes the Alakazam after a nasty plot. You know, you gotta say crazy lucky for the channel, 6.3%, as you mentioned. So that left Alchemy against the world. Um, Porygon 2 is able to just toxic it. And that's it. That's all she wrote. Um, Porygon 2 can just recover stall. Basically, the Alchemy till it dies. Yes. Alakazam, I'm not sure what moves it had, but it would have had to have a Focus Blast or whatever to kill Paragon 2 or Nucky plot up some more or, you know, options like that. But being Magic Guard, it wouldn't have taken any poison damage. So it was just really unfortunate for mm-hmm. uh, the core fish that that happened. And, and that, that one turn changed the match. And that's the thing, and, too. Um, yeah. Magic Guard, you don't get affected by poison, right? Like, if you get poisoned or rocks or things like that, you don't get affected by it. Hmm. Am, I, am I thinking about so, the right ability? Yep. Yeah, you don't, you don't take, you only take direct damage. You don't take any, you don't so, take damage from anything that's not an, an attack, basically. Yeah, so you would think uh, <clears throat> that uh, that ability would block freeze, too, since it blocks poison and burn. So, yeah, but I guess freeze doesn't do damage. Like if it was like um, Legends Arceus, where frostbite, where you know you take a bit of damage, or whatever. But mm-hmm. um, with freeze, you don't take any damage, so it's not affected by Magic Guard. I guess they. But yeah. Anyway, either way, it was an unlucky turn for the Corfish that changed the match. And by the same token, it was GG to the Chardinals. They clicked try attack just to do damage to break the focus sash. They didn't know it was going to freeze. Mm-hmm. And it happened to freeze. It could have just as easily poisoned or burned um, and done nothing. So uh, it was the right play. And who knows? I'm not quite sure of the uh, whether it was specially defensive Porygon or physically defensive. But even if it did, even if Alakazam did have a focus blast, it might not have taken out Porygon two and one hit anyway. So oh, yeah. it might have meant nothing. And then again, it might have. So I that'll be would... for one of those what if. I think it would have Scenario. had to go two shot with the uh, side shot because I don't believe Alex had quite focus blast. Well, there you go. That would have changed the changed the course of the match either way. But uh, yeah, we you, you take those um, you take those hex scenarios because you know that one day it will happen to you in the same scenario. So you just take it and mm-hmm. GG to the Cardinals. And that is a GG to the Cardinals. Hopefully, Cornish Corfish could bounce back from that. And that brings us to our next battle for the week. Yes, now we have the uh, Wishy Washies, coached by Lily, versus the Rebellion, coached by Lucian. The Wiki Waki. Oh, no, so, yes, the Wiki Waki, Wiki Waki Wishy Washies. Um, this is a great match. If you haven't watched it, I recommend going to watch it. Um, very much, you know, a lot of these battles are quite entertaining. Very much a click button person, as we've said before. And yeah did you happen to uh, get a view of this one this match is one of the ones i didn't get to watch uh as it came out <laughs> that's no problem so um yeah for me the moment of the match was when lily sent in her rillaboom in front of the celesteela i don't know if she's predicting a double leech seed or a protect but it got absolutely obliterated by a uh, heavy slam so once again rillaboom doesn't do much unfortunately for Lily and yeah that was a huge huge turning point pretty much got rid of any physical threat that it could have been um especially in front of Celesteela which was the one mine was probably designed to do something against but uh unfortunately for Lily the the Celesteela wasn't at low enough health at that point <laughs> so from the very start we see it, you know it's a great lead for Lily 
um, it's Polytone in front of Flygon. Nine times out of ten, you'd expect the Polytone to win this matchup. Um, Polytone tanks the scale shot against Flygon, which gets rocked by a Scald. Luckily for Lucian, it doesn't burn. However, Polytone then tanks another scale shot, and this time Flygon goes down to another Scald. So Flygon does nothing this week, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Milk Tank comes out and clicks Thunder Punch to try and finish the Polytone off, but Lily switches to Rhyperia, who is, of course, immune. Milk Tank sets up the rocks and gets hit by a big Stone Edge, which does like 50%, which is, you know, shows how strong Rhyperia can be. Uh, Lily then sends in her mascot, Wishy Washy, predicting a Milk Tank from Milk Tank, and that's exactly what happens. So at this stage of the match, you're like, oh yeah, Lily's in control. She's got a, um, she's predicted a few uh, good switches and turns here. So she now obviously wants to take advantage of that momentum and she decides to Dynamax. And um, Wishy Washy goes big boy as Miltank reveals its fourth move. And what is the fourth move? Body Slam. Body slam. And what does it do? It paralyzes the Wishy Washy turn one of Dynamax. Not only that, it fully paralyzes. So that's the first match turn wasted. And then Lily clicks Max Steel Spike for turn two. However, Lucian has switched to Celesteela, which takes this no problem at all. After taking a you know, barely a scratch from that move, it protects the still out the last turn of Dynamax, which is a Max Geyser from the Wishy Washy. Now, what was unfortunate about this is that it's actually the same turn that Polyto's Rain runs out. So, no, it was the Rain running out. Max Geyser didn't get to set up the Rain. So, Kingdra had no Rain at this stage. Mm -hmm. Wishy Washy, Wishy Washy stayed in post Dynamax and got leech seated by the Celesteela and then missed the Hydro Pump, which, <laughs> while not game changing, was going to be important damage on the Celesteela. Lily decides to switch into Rhyperia, which has a fair chunk taken out of it by Heavy Slam, which for Celesteela reveals to have. I know it's super effective, but you know, Rhyperia is quite heavy as well, so it still did a you know, reasonable amount considering all those factors solid yeah. rock, etc. Rhyperia then gets Rhyperia then gets leech seeded as well and hits a stone edge which Celesteela just takes quite well considering. Yeah, Celesteela is that Pokemon that just tanks things out and surprisingly dishes it out. Yeah, you know, definitely an ultra beast for sure. <laughs> so while, while this is happening, you know, Celesteela is just regaining health, a ton of health from leech seed, leftovers. And there's not much, Lily's throwing everything she can at it, and it's just taking all these hits. I think it's still in the green at this stage, maybe just in the yellow. Lily's obviously getting a little bit annoyed with the Celesteela, so she sends in her Rillaboom, um, predicting either a Protect or a Leech Seed, and mm -hmm. it gets smacked by the Heavy Stone, which, as I mentioned, was the moment of the match. To be honest, I probably would have stacked Wishy Washy here to preserve Rillaboom's health if I wanted Rillaboom in. Would have given it a free switch. But, um, I mean, Rillaboom does 50% to Celesteela with Superpower. Which, um, you know, is the most that's been done to it so far. But then it gets killed by a second Heavy Slam, because, of course, it has the defense drop, and it was quite low on health anyway. Yeah. And then Cel Celesteela reveals its Beast Boost to be Spit F. So, um, Beast Boost raises the highest stat. So it was obviously especially the defense of Celesteela, which makes sense, because it's naturally very physically bulky, especially due to its typing. Yeah, and then you got so to get the screen. rain team, so you want to <laughs> Exactly, so you got a pl pl plus one spin death to the Plato gets sent back out. Um, it sets up the rain, but more importantly, it gets to pair a song with Celesteela, so it can't just sit there all day. However, it then dies to a heavy slam, which probably isn't the worst thing, because um, Polito wasn't going to do a lot to it, except maybe get lucky and burn it with a scald or something. So mm -hmm. Lily sends in, sends in her Rhyperia, um, hoping to finish off the Celesteela with a Stone Edge. Would have been touch and go with her, it was going to kill from that range, but uh, Celesteela gets saved and gets switched out for Nidoking, which only takes 25% from the Stone Edge. So, this is the point where Lily goes, oh well, you know, I've got to hit the Kingdra button now. I've got my last few rain turns. Mm. So she hard switches into Kingdra, mm. and Nidoking hits it with an Ice Beam. Um, didn't, didn't want to keep Nidoking in front of the Kingdra, obviously, so Milk Tank comes in, and then it dies to a crit surf. Might have died anyway, it's quite a strong move in the rain, but um, Milk Tank goes down to a crit surf, leaving Mr. Rhyme to come in. It also takes 75% from surf, but uh, it kills Kingdra with a freeze dry, four times super effective. 
but then he goes into wishy washy which of course is still paralyzed quite low health but then switches straight into zatu which has to take a freeze dry and it doesn't do it very well i don't i don't really understand that play either um maybe trying to bait a different move but mr ryan had no reason not to click freeze dry there uh deathling gleam does nothing from zatu into the arcanine which gets switched in and then crit play rough to zatu I don't think the crit mattered because R2 is quite low already, but you know, it's another crit in this match. Mm -hmm. Rhyperia comes in, clicks EQ, which Lucian sacks Nido King. I don't know if they're predicting another Stone Edge, but um, Nido King gets destroyed by the EQ. Celesteela protects to waste another Stone Edge PP, and Leech Seeds, as Rhyperia gets a big crit Stone Edge to rid the Wishy Washies of that menace that was Celesteela. So eventually she did kill it, which was probably the highest point of the match for the wishy washies yeah that's that However, by this stage of the game pretty much <laughs> exactly so um the game's pretty much wrapped up at this point mr ryan maxes and hits the big max hail on riparia who unfortunately misses the mega horn and then goes down to a max mindstorm whether or not that mega horn miss would have killed it i'm not sure but either way it was a really close fought battle uh in the 2-1 timer which I guess sums up the match really. If it was a non-timer match, I don't know how it would have gone in the end. I think Mr. Ryan had it set up from there. Oh, yeah. It was pretty hexy, but it was entertaining. It was good. It was another entertaining Lily match. Failing everything else, win or loss, it's they're definitely entertaining. So definitely worth a watch if you get a chance. And then that brings us to, I believe, our second to last battle. It sure does. So we have the uh, Chicago Chonks, coached by it's Danny Mac against the Vegas Club, GMO. Is that right? Yeah. Did I get it right this time? Vegas yeah. Club, you got it. First try. <laughs> <laughs> First try, yes. So, of course, this is the uh, GMO's second match in the league, and they had a very, very convincing win last week to um, get themselves the first win. Mm -hmm. This week, uh, for me, the moment of the match was um max arachnid coming in even before it was dynamax that um got to kill dragon eye with an ice beam thinking that it was free to dragon dance no it wasn't and yeah uh, arachnid gets coming at the end and max geysers to finish off the uh win for the gmo so arachnid another great bug there's lots of great bug types out there uh arachnid i know it's uh you know you you don't mind a bit of arachnid yourself so Oh yeah, I love it's some good to see. Yeah. It's uh, always good to see it come in and do the recorded thing. Um, I do have to note, uh, Danny did talk to me a little bit after the match, um, and he felt like he really had this game in hand uh, when he had the what was it? What was in front of the Araquanid swing? <clears throat> he said Podcast. He, yeah, he said he misclicked the move by accident because it was two moves that had the same color, same typing. Right. And they both started with the same letter. And he was like, if I would have got rid of that thing when I did, I think it was when uh, he had Dragonite in front of it earlier in the game. Oh, I'll, I'll um, talk, talk through the match and you can uh, jump in where you think it was that he clicked the wrong move. Yeah, it was around the middle of the match. Uh, it was uh, Dragonite uh -huh. versus Arachnid. <laughs> and Danny was already set up with a dra one Dragon Dance. And he said he meant to yeah, click... Yeah, it's to click Wingby? Yeah. Right. Makes sense. And he clicked Dragon Dance so, um, instead. Yeah. So we have um, Swamp of a Crocodile here. Pretty great lead for uh, Team Mo. Mm-hmm. So Crocodile clicks knock off turn one and Swampert gets the rocks up. Uh, Crocodile knocks off the Rocky Helmet as well, which you know takes a little bit of chip. And then it EQs to do some more damage to the Swampert as Swampert flip turns out into him on top, which as we know, generally has an Intimidate. So it Intimidates the Crocodile. So Danny switches that out into Vileplume and Vileplume reveals itself to be Rocky Helmet as well. As usual. As, um, <laughs> yeah, as him on top bullet punches it. Um, failing that, the Jingmao still decide to click Triple Axel, so Vileplume gets rocked by these ice moves. Each hit does hit my top damage though, thanks to the helmet. 
and then Valkyrie gets to restore some of its health with Giga Drain. So, him on top can't stay in here. So, he gets switched out into Hydreigon, and as Valkyrie strength snaps, he gets back even more health. Of course, being a special attacker, it's not so critical if Hydreigon loses its attack. So, um, here I'm not quite sure what Danny predicts Hydreigon to do, but he sends in Kangaskhan and he gets absolutely blown back by a Draco Media blown off the face of the planet. <laughs> I'm not sure if it was a deliberate sack or if he predicted something else, but um, either way, it was gone from the match. Early uh, elimination there for the Jing Mo. Did yeah. you happen to mention that one at all? No, that one was just a questionable play to me too as well. I mean, a Vile Plume still could have been useful, but I don't think it's worth sacking off your Wish Passer in, in that time of the match. Especially when Kangaskhan's been like MVP several games over the season so far so mm -hmm. yeah it's gone so uh he's got not much, not much choice but to send in hitmon lee to face the hydragon and the jmo sends a metagross hitmon lee rapid spins first off and then hits a high jump kick on the metagross metagross takes agility so it doubles its speed and then meteor mashes the incoming vile plume and what does vile plume have rocky helmet so metagross takes a bit more chip and then kills Crocodile that comes in to intimidate it, but it has clear body with Earthquake. And this is where Danny sends in Dragonite with, uh, in front of Metagross. So Metagross packs Ice Punch, which does over half. Thanks to multi-scale, Dragonite gets to survive it, of course, and it takes out the Metagross. Um, Arachnid gets sent in and clicks Ice Beam here. And this is where I assume was the misclick, where Dragon, uh, Dragonite thinks it's free to click Dragon Dance, but actually it was supposed to be Joel Wingbeat. Yeah. <laughs> Don't know he if it would have taken. Yeah. He said he had a calc to where uh, he believed he would have knocked out the Arachnid or at least got it super low to where it wouldn't have been a problem later in the game. Right. So this that's a game changing moment then, can't that's you know, that changes everything really, because uh one of Danny's biggest threats is eliminated and Arachnid's at pretty much full house, so um game changing gotta be careful on those clicks i know when you're excited or you're in a hurry or whatever you think i can click buttons but i'm sure he won't make that mistake again next week he'll be extra careful yeah keep those same color uh moves away from <laughs> each other <laughs> that's right um so danny sends in his poltergeist to sit in front of the air equinet but immediately switches it to vol flame i don't know if he predicted um eric to liquidation or something and takes some chip but at the same time hit one top gets sent in so that was just a double switch from both players hit one top gets taken out and swamp gets sent in to set up the rocks again before dying to giga drain mm -hmm. and god was next to face wall plumes i've all plumes are sitting there you know it's just take it hasn't physically done much but it's been taking the hits and regaining health so doing its job um gets hit with a slice shot and then chunks the Gardevoir with a sludge bomb. Gardevoir then takes out the Vile Plume with Psy Shock and that sends Poltergeist back in. At this point, um, the Jigmo sack their uh, Hitmontop to a uh, Max Mindstorm. Of course, Poltergeist Shell Smash first and then uh, Dynamax the turn after. Yeah. Hitmontop dies to the Max Mindstorm and then I don't know what moves Poltergeist had, but it clicks Max Phantasm against Hydreigon, which doesn't do a ton. And Hydreigon knocks it back with Dark Pulse, kills it even though it's Dynamaxed. After it's, um, yeah, Dark Pulse, strong, strong move from a Hydreigon, of course. Yeah, I don't think so. Um, that leaves uh, Hitmonlee. Sorry? I was going to say, I don't think uh, Sinistee or what's, it, what's the evolved form? <laughs> Poltergeist. Poltergeist, there we go. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think Poltergeist would have the kind of coverage to hit a Hydreigon anyway. Nah, probably not. And, um, you know, Hitmonlee has to face a record and a record maxes, max geysers, and finish it off. It's a happy 2 0 wins in GMO. And, like I said, what a start to the league for them. Mm -hmm. Going back, another top contender. Yeah, and. Before going into the match, Danny wouldn't have expected to have such a matchup. Yeah, and the Jingma O is coming in. Uh... 
taking over a team uh, for sadly Dusty who had to drop from the league and he's been uh, taking the reins and going pretty well and the team seemed to just fit his style. It's just a really great combination of Mons, I think he's got, and uh, he obviously knows how to use them because that's two from two. Yeah, and lastly, but not leastly, we got our game of the week. <clears throat> so game of the week, it was a bit of a late upload, but um, I purposely hadn't worked out a game of the week for this reason, because I thought this one in particular was going to be a close match, and ooh, it didn't disappoint. It did not disappoint. Um, Melvin, ultimately, spoilers, came through with a win here. It didn't look like it was going to be so easy halfway through the match, but uh, he clutches it out. <clears throat> For me, the uh, moment of the match was the uh, mid, mid-game mid mini-sweep by Togekiss. You never know if Togekiss was going to be offensive or defensive, but it set up a uh, nasty plot and got a few kills, which uh, set Melvin back on course after a bit of a rough start yeah this game was certainly a back and forth one um it's crazy how melvin was able to set up that nasty plot i actually remember now i did watch this match um and there was nothing john uh or uh scrub supreme could have really done about this match uh well about that togekiss at that point and he just had to start sacking mons before he could actually get his uh, feet back under him and try to make that comeback towards the tail end of the game. Yeah, exactly right. It was definitely, uh, I don't know if he expected Nazi Pot Toggy Kiss, but um, it was a great bring by Melbourne. And especially since uh, Scrub's <clears throat> team is not the fastest, so even uh, Toggy Kiss at, with the build it has at base 80 speed, he was able to um, outspeed most of his team and still do some good chunk damage to it. Yeah, so the start of the match oh, was um, Melvin lead his Gudra against Scrub Supreme's Clearing and Weezing. It's not a great situation when you got your Dragon type out there in front of a very type, but uh, unless it was an offensive Weezing, it wouldn't do a ton to Gudra, let's face it. So. The bad, the bad lead is compounded by the fact that his turn one miss of Muddy Water and then is confused by Strange Team. And I'm like, oh, Melvin, what a start. Like, you couldn't have written a worse start, really. Yeah. Apart from maybe a, apart from maybe a crit Strange Team, that would have been the only thing that could have made it worse. But getting the, getting the matchup lead wrong, missing a Muddy Water and getting confused by a super effective Strange Team, bad start. So predicting another Strange Team, he switches to Mag Water. However, turn two... Scrub has clicked Toxic, and that tox uh, Magmortar gets Toxic. So whether or not Magmortar was intended to be his Maxmon or whatever, it's going to be severely hurt here by this Toxic Poison. Um, it clicks Psychic. I don't know if he expected Weezing to stay in. Wouldn't have really mattered. He switches to Turdinator. Magmortar takes Turd down to the red with a second Psychic, and then gets Scorching Sands. And... Um, the Cremorants then decide to save Turtonator, despite it being on 10%. Mm-hmm. And Bronzon, Bronzon takes the resistance Psychic while Magmortar dies to poison. So Magmortar, the threat, is gone. Um, Melvin sends in his Togekiss and Shadow Balls to Bronzon as it sets up a light screen. He then switches to Gudra, who has to take a heavy slam. And Gudra then Thunderbolts to Bronzon. Gudra uses Muddy Water and actually hits it. And Bronzong heavy slams the Gujra again. Predicting another Muddy Water scrub switches to Gyarados, but in fact Melvin has clicked Focus Blast. I'm not quite sure why. Um, didn't really, couldn't really hear the commentary on that part, so I'm not sure what his thought process was there. But either way, it missed, so it wouldn't have done much to Gyarados anyway. But it was like a wasted turn there. Gyarados then takes out Gujra with Ice Fang. However, it is slowed down by Gui in the process. Um, Melvin sends in his Mana Swine, which gets absolutely destroyed by Waterfall uh, after hitting only two Icicle Spears. Um, it was basically a sack there. I don't know if the two Icicle Spears would have made a difference for the next couple of turns, but mm-hmm. this is where Melvin decides to just turn things around. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this match mine. I'm going to send in my Togekiss. So 
Tokus comes in on the Gyarados, which of course is slower now because of the GUI. Mm-hmm. And Scrub switches in his Bronze Zone, and Tokus clicks Nasty Plot. So we've got a plus two for Tokus here. It just um, kills, finishes off the Bronze Zone with Shadow Ball. It then does 90% to Weezing with Air Slash. However, the trouble for the Cramorants here is that um, Weezing activates Togekiss' weakness policy, and so now it's plus four special attack. Uh, Weezing's then finished off, and Thwacky comes in. Um, I was like, why is he sending Thwacky? Um, not thinking about the next part of the game, but Thwacky comes in and dies. It does a, it does a bit of chip with Grass and Glide, but essentially it's a sack because Lucha comes in, and of course it activates its Terrain Barrier, and I'm like, nah, that makes sense. Probably, um, you know, couldn't save Thwacky there, had to stop the sweep, because otherwise it would have just destroyed everyone. Uh, activates it to Berry, and therefore it activates its Unburden, and then kills the Togekiss with Rock Slide. Yeah. So you've got, um, Togekiss has done its little mini sweep, you've got Holucha there. It didn't set up an SD or anything, but it has its Unburden, so it's faster than everything that Melvin's got. Yeah, but see, at that point, but luckily um, for him, it, uh, real quick, it was an interesting play that he did that, because... I believe um, he got Thwacky in for free, and he still had uh, Turtonator in the back with like that very low HP. He could have sacked the Turtonator. Oh, yeah. Uh, kept his You're terrain right. and still boosted his Halucha and had uh, Thwacky there late game, too. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, lucky for Mel when he's got Mimikyu in the back. Um, Scrub Supreme switches out his Halucha, which I guess makes sense because it couldn't have killed. Mimikyu in one hit and would have died to a play rough, so he decides to sack his Turtonator there. Uh, Gyarados intimidates the Mimikyu, who then burns it, mm-hmm. and has his disguise broken by Waterfall. They trade a couple of, you know, weakened hits because Mimikyu's minus one and Gyarados is burned. And then eventually Mimikyu finishes off the Gyarados and Lucha comes back in. He does a bit of chip with Shadow Snake and gets killed by Acrobatics. And it leaves Sinchino to finish off a, uh, a ultimately clutch 1-0 win. Um, for Melvin, great match. It was well worthy of game of the week. What I thought was interesting was that no one Dynamax. This match had no Dynamax, and I don't know if that made the game closer, but it felt like it. By the end of the match, I was like, "Oh wow, it's one 0 So GG. Yeah, it was certainly a very interesting game on how it played out. Very low in RNG, which was which was probably the best part of it, because <laughs> that's what made the game really shine because the coaches really had to show off their <laughs> skill in this one to try to fight back and forth for uh momentum and exactly right and unluckily for scrub it was melvin who came out on top at the very end yes unluckily for now um unluckily for scrub but uh very positive for melvin definitely needed their win to uh you know stay close to the leaders stay close in the top four there so yeah game of the week well done I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad he got a win there because he it was not looking positive halfway through that match. <laughs> it went from looking like a sweep to a 1-0 victory in the person's favor. That's right. All right. Well, that is our games of the weeks of this week anyway. And that brings us to our MVP announcement for week four. And we had two candidates who were fighting for it. Togekiss with three kills, one death. We had Noivern with three kills and one death. The only difference was Noivern's team won a 4-0 victory, meaning it had a bigger impact for its team. Uh, even though it was a valiant effort by Togekiss bringing back Melvin's team to get them that 1-0 victory. So the MVP for this week is Noivern. Of Team Tempest, coached by Kiwi. GG. GG. <laughs> and that's the best part about this league is you never know who can be uh, MVP. And Noivern with its infiltrator abilities, getting some kills on Clef Key, and um, making those screens non existent and turning it around for his team. Not that he ever lost momentum after he gained his positioning after the pivot at the, at the beginning mm. but you know annoy, <clears throat> annoy probably, burn coming at you is scary that's right they probably would have um, got even more kills if he'd remembered that um, 
gale winds was a thing because he probably could have switched to the road on sooner and not sacked it but that's for another day yeah i mean that's the game we played that is pokemon uh sometimes you remember abilities sometimes you don't but at the end of the day exactly right. you still went home with that award for this week and lastly but not leastly we're gonna go over the ranking for this week uh week four i'll go over kanto um we have uh, the new england chartreets myself at three and one with plus nine uh next up we have the vegas club jangmo o's at three and one with a plus four third we have the chicago chonks with three and one at plus one and then at fourth place we have melvin at two and two with negative one differential um fifth place we have team tempest at two and two with negative two sixth place we have cf cramorant at one and three with negative two the Nawahata Hoppers at seventh place with one win, three losses, and negative three differential. And lastly, but certainly not leastly, we got the New York Aqua Jets sitting at eighth place with that one and three record with a negative seven differential. <clears throat> well, I've got a question though: Is, Are the Chunks actually three and one? I thought they were two and two. Um, I believe. They are three and one. I'll double check that real quick. Uh, I'll let you go ahead. I'm pretty sure he lost. We... Okay, so in the Gala division, we have the Arizona Cardinals. They are the only unbeaten team in either division, and they are four and zero. Oh. They've got a plus nine differential. They're going to take some catching, that's for sure. We've got the McKinney Park Slowpokes, who have been very impressive recently. They've got a three and one record with a plus seven differential. The Virginia Victinis, they are three and one as well. And their differential is zero at the moment. Um, you know, better than the negative one they had last week, so that's for sure. They've got the Crushing Hill Valleys coming in fourth. Uh, two and two with a plus two differential. You've got the uh, Wiki 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 with a one and three with a minus four differential. Uh, the sixth place, you've got the Cornish Corfish with also one and three. But they've got a minus five differential. You've got the... Uh, Pinkatonica Fire Squirrels, they are one and three as well, with a minus six differential. And you've got the Rebellion, who finally claimed their first win this week, with a one and three record and minus seven differential. So you've got four teams in that division on one and three, separated by one differential point each. So that division is anyone's game, really. Um, of course, it looks like the Chardinals and the Slowpokes will be belling it out with the Victinis to claim the top three spots. But definitely looking for that fourth position you've got quite a few teams battling for it yeah and uh you are right it was my mistake i don't know how i read it wrong but i did uh it is the team tempest in the in third place with the three and one with the one plus one differential and it's the chunks in fifth place with a two and two differential with negative two different i mean two and two record with negative two differential yeah i'll just never forget the uh steel beam cliff key that's that's what reminded me <laughs> <laughs> that that's that was certainly some check <clears throat> and uh don't forget guys this video is a little late so you might have already seen week five by this time but we hope to see y'all for the week five recaps coming next saturday thank you